so much for joining us today. First, we'd like to start by asking you if you can just tell us briefly a little bit about yourself and some of the work that you do. Great, thanks for having me. So my name is Samira Ahmed and I'm a lawyer at Justice for Children and Youth. Justice for Children and Youth is a provincially funded uh, legal aid clinic that has a mandate to offer legal advice exclusively to young people under the age of 18 and unstably housed young people up until the age of 25. Um, so we provide legal advice and assistance on a broad variety of subject matters, basically anything that uniquely affects a child. So you can imagine youth criminal justice is a common one, but also immigration, um, child protection, human rights oriented issues, education, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, and part of the fun part of our work is in addition to doing casework, we also do public legal education, as well as law reform to try and advocate as best as possible on, on behalf of children. And so I've been doing that for about nine years now. That's perfect. Thanks so much, Samira. So my second question is, as someone who works with a large number of young people in your daily practice, what would you say are some of the challenges that young people face specifically when they're involved in the justice system? Yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the key tenets of the youth criminal justice system is that young people are supposed to be treated separately and distinctly from adults in the criminal justice system. And, you know, that's a really important piece to the youth criminal justice system. However, the manner and way that it, it, in, in how that's executed is actually quite problematic because obviously young people are processed at the exact same police stations as adults while they're held separately there they're still in the, the cold look and feel of an adult um, oriented space in lots of ways and, and, a, and, a, and a space that really isn't child friendly at all, regardless of the fact that there's, there's different rules in place for young people at the police station. And then you take that to a criminal justice courthouse and the building is the same as, as adults and children where they go for their court process and it looks just as cold and as sterile as it is for adults. And so it becomes this really daunting and overwhelming process for a young person from that perspective. Um, and so, you know, that's just on the surface of what you can see right at the, at the get go. But I think that the other challenges that young people face in the criminal justice system is that while it's supposed to be you know, a timely intervention for young people consistent with when the incident happens and when it's actually resolved, you know, there's a real question of whether or not something's timely. Um, and that's because when you get charged, you don't have your first appearance for 60 to 90 days. And even at the 60 and 90 day mark, the disclosure from the police about the evidence that they've gathered is often not ready. And so if you talk about the way that young people perceive time, you see that really things move quite slowly, even though they move much quicker, for example, than in the adult criminal justice system. So I think that young people really struggle with how long it takes to figure out what's gonna happen and the uncertainty that comes in the process from that perspective. Um, and it's, it's a large uh, institutionalized setting for young people. And it's not the institutional setting that we want young people to be in. So those would be my kind of initial comments of some of the struggles that young people have in the system. Thanks, Samira. We know too that the Convention on the Rights of the Child can be a potential tool for potentially remedying some of these issues. Obviously, these are really complex issues to address, um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the Convention on the Rights of the Child guides the work that you do with young people. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the UNCRC is a great tool for advocacy on behalf of young people generally in the sense that it creates the high level structure in terms of what should be in place in order to create a rights respecting system for young people. And I would actually argue that the UNCRC does the best job in the context of youth criminal justice. Um, to some extent, other than than in other systems and that's because the rules and, and rights of young people that are set out in the convention are expanded on in a really robust way through, for example, the Beijing rules, and then the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child commentary on juvenile justice. Um, my only criticism of the UNCRC, obviously, is that it does condone the criminalization of young people, which is you know, kind of the million dollar question to start with in terms of uh, young people and whether or not there should be any criminalization of them to begin with. 
Um, but uh, what's great about the UNCRC is that it is directly incorporated into the preamble of the Youth Criminal Justice Act. And a lot of the commentary from the Beijing rules is actually directly inputted into the statute, which makes it, you know, have a look and feel um, of being um, a rights respecting legislation. And certainly, you know, what's good is that the Youth Criminal Justice Act, you know, is a, is a wild improvement <laughs> from the, the YOA that was in place before it. Um, from that perspective, it's the Youth Criminal Justice Act is old now. It's been in place since around 2003, if I'm not mistaken. And as a result of that, you know, we kind of take for granted the rights and protections that are directly inputted in the Youth Criminal Justice Act. So it, it, what's good is that it does establish a framework within the legislation. In terms of how we use it in practice on top of the you know, pieces that are already inputted in the legislation, what I would say is that we try and draw the court's attention to um, what actually having a child's rights respecting system looks like. Um, and because, again, you know, the judges that are very often are dealing with young people are also dealing with adults. And so you really have to pull the court's attention, you know, at every opportunity to the unique, unique nuances of children in the criminal justice system. And, you know, forcing them to do that can be as simple as when you're making sentencing um, submissions to talk really about the young person in their life what their likes and dislikes are just so that the young person actually feels as though they're a person rather than a piece of paper before the criminal justice system in terms of the crime that they've committed. Um, and to help young people find a way to really meaningfully participate in the process is really important to us. Um, so that might be helping a young person draft a letter that's not going to criminalize them more <laughs> than they already are, but also helps them articulate some of the pieces that they would really want a court to know and appreciate. So, you know, the tenets of the right to participate and the right to be treated as a child are, you know, up, up front and center in terms of how we approach things. And sometimes we can really upset the court from that perspective because it takes longer when you try and actually take a rights respecting approach to representation of children. Um, but that's really important to our work and to make sure that young people actually feel as though they do have rights in the process. Okay, that's great. I actually just wanted to ask you a quick follow up to what you just said. So you talked about participation in the youth criminal justice system. So in your opinion, what are some of the changes that can be made in order for young people to feel like they are being provided with this right? You know, it's a great question. And I and I think it's a controversial question, to be honest, because fundamentally, if we're going to criminalize young people, then there is, you know, rights oriented challenges for young people having an enhanced right to participate because the question is what does it mean to participate, right? Does it, does participation mean that a young person can share what their experience of an incident is outside of a trial? Well, that's problematic, right? <laughs> because if they're not intending to accept responsibility either through um, an extrajudicial measure, an extrajudicial sanction, or a guilty plea, then you have a young person admitting guilt, right? Um, and and that, that poses a really big challenge. And one of the tenants to representation of children in, or adults, frankly, in the criminal justice system is that you don't ask too many questions until you've reviewed the disclosure. And you don't do that purposefully because of the fact that lawyers aren't allowed to lie. Right. And so we like to rely on the holes and in, in the investigation of a police officer, more so than the account of a young person in an incident. And that's part of the trauma that gets inlaid into a, a youth criminal justice system. You can imagine a young person who is wrongfully convicted of a murder, who has a struggle in terms of accessing counseling, uh, because they're not supposed to be talking about the incident. They're not supposed to be talking about the incident with their parents because their parents can become a witness. And then they're also not supposed to be talking about it with their lawyer because their lawyer wants to try and keep a little bit of a guard up to prevent um, either the need to step down from their representation or to alter their arguments, right? Um, so there's a real controversy in terms of what the right to participate looks like. 
But um, you know, what, one of the good ways that young people have an opportunity to participate is through what's called Section 19 case conferences. So a case conference is, is a meeting that's held off of the record um, that can include the judge it can, or a justice of the peace. It can include the crown attorney and various other members of the young person's circle of care, including their counsel. And it's an opportunity to have um, a discussion about resolution of a particular issue. So for example, it could be resolution of a bail hearing or um, for a young person to be determined whether they're gonna be held in custody or what the plan should be if they're gonna be released from custody or it can also be to figure out what an appropriate sentence might be for a young person if you're crafting something unique. What's good about the Section 19 conference is that it's off the record and nobody can rely on it on the record. Um, so admittedly, I unless we're going to change, you know, the criminalization of young people, I don't know that we're going to have a better mechanism for the right to participate. I think that the, the job is really placed on uh, defense counsel to be competent to find creative solutions to include a young person in the process as best as possible. But so long as it's a criminal justice process, it has to remain in kind of rigid confines that, you know, are controversial in some ways. Okay, great. That's really, really interesting. Thank you for that. So I just wanted to ask you about a more current event. So very recently, we learned that 26 youth detention centers will be closing in Ontario. So in your opinion, what are the implications of this for young people and for the youth criminal justice system? You know, it, it was a really fascinating announcement that came out um, and it's fascinating for a number of different reasons. Um, one is the fact that none of the, you know, uh, bar or operators of uh, correctional programs or youth custodial programs were actually um, uh, consulted in the process of making this decision, which is huge, um, but partially it's because they knew what they were going to say, which was don't shut us down. <laughs> so they just kind of wanted to steamroll the process. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, there's a number of different problems. Specifically, I'm quite concerned about the fact that Syllabs is going to be closing. And uh, the Syllabs custodial facility is designed largely to assist young people who have complex mental health and developmental disabilities that wouldn't be well serviced uh, in the context of, you know, a standard youth criminal justice uh, facility. And that is a huge difficulty um, in terms of the, the fact that we know and understand that young people with complex mental health difficulties and developmental disabilities are already overrepresented within the youth criminal justice system. And as a result, there's a risk to their overrepresentation within the population of young people that are being held in custody. And now you have facilities that are gonna be less equipped to address those vulnerabilities um, because Syllabs is kind of one of the only facilities in the province that has what's called the secure treatment facility. So they have a robust kind of treatment team in place um, because they operate both a youth custodial program and a non-custodial program. So that's you know something that's specifically problematic about the announcement. But the other big issue with the announcement is that largely lots of the facilities that are closing are from rural and remote communities. So for example, up north. And so when you talk about access to justice, we know and understand that access to justice looks and, and feels differently depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. And if you're in a remote community and you have to be held in custody, and now you're gonna be coming all the way to central Ontario, that raises all sorts of questions because we know that young people's largest, the largest proportion of young people who are in custody are in what's called remand custody. And remand custody means that you haven't pled guilty, but you're not really eligible to be released from a youth, youth uh, custodial facility um, pending the resolution of your charges. And so, you know, that kind of custody can be very short. It could be one day, it could be two days, it could be three days or it could be two months. If it's three days, you're talking about a large transportation of a young person and then their immediate transportation back and how rights respecting and trauma informed is that. 
Um, and then on the larger spectrum, you're talking about young people being entirely and totally disconnected from their support system. So parents can't come visit you, siblings can't come visit you. You know, if you're entitled to go out in the community, which you might be in terms of an open custody facility, it's a totally different environment for you that you're completely and entirely disconnected from. Um, so those are huge issues that, to, to be honest, already existed prior to the closure of these facilities, but are certainly going to be more exaggerated. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, it was really disappointing to hear about that. It almost kind of reminds me actually of when the Provincial Child and Youth Advocate Office was closed down. You know, there was really kind of no consultation about that. The office found out through the media. So, it, you know, it's kind of like disappointing news kind of happening all over again. There's almost a pattern there. So it's really interesting to hear your insight on that. So thanks for, for expanding on that. One of the things we also wanted to ask you about was how has the pandemic impacted your work with youth in the justice system. You know, we know that the pandemic has kind of sparked a whole range of enhanced inequalities. So it'd be really interesting to hear from your perspective how you see the impact of the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that history tells us is that the most vulnerable populations are the hardest affected by any sort of natural disaster or, or pandemic. And, you know, young people are certainly no exception to that talking about you know what a young person's life should typically look like in terms of access to school and access to community supports that's been art, art, you know altered in such a unbelievable and kind of unfathomable way um, since the pandemic and it just hasn't really let up over the last year and so you know i think the the ways that the pandemic has affected us is that primarily all services are online so all youth criminal justice courts are operating online uh, and by telephone. Um, so if you don't have access to a computer, you can call in. However, for the first several months of the pandemic, actually all youth criminal justice appearances were just postponed. So again, if you're talking about one of the key tenants of the youth criminal justice system, which is a timely intervention, that's certainly been challenged uh, significantly in terms of how the pandemic um, has affected young people. And the second thing that I would say is, uh, you know, young people within the youth criminal justice system are supposed to have the underlying causes of their criminality addressed in order to form a, a meaningful resolution for a young person. And the question is, how do you do that when all community services are kind of operating um, in, a, in a reduced capacity and in different capacity? And how does that look? And so what happens is that you have young people who don't have access to a phone, who don't have access to the internet, who are suddenly kind of losing their entire access to this structure of, of systems and supports that's designed to address their underlying you know, the underlying causes of their behavior, which is highly problematic. And certainly we've seen that, that the most vulnerable young people, so young people who don't have um, a parent or guardian in the picture, young people who don't have the assistance of a child protection agency and don't have a larger support system in place, have largely fallen through the cracks within the last 12 months. And so what that looks like is that either there's no progress with regards to their charges or there's an escalation in terms of their criminalization because that's the only system that's responding to their behavior. Uh, which if there's an escalation of the criminalization, then what you see is there's more young people like that who are in custody. Uh, and, uh, and then there's just a general kind of sense that the youth criminal justice system is not going to be able to offer them any assistance or supports. And that might be a struggle with their counsel as well. Um, and so it's, it's a really unpredictable way to be operating the, in, in the youth criminal justice system, frankly. Um, and it creates a lot of more work for counsel. And it's certainly um, a distressing experience for lots of young people. But the one advantage that I would say to the pandemic justice system is that the court system is a little bit more friendly. So you can imagine that, you know, having to travel to a courthouse that's far from your house and to take time off of school to be able to explain to your school why you're missing this time is quite challenging for a lot of young people in the criminal justice system who want to keep that involvement private and confidential and ought to keep that involvement private and confidential. 
However, if you just have to make a quick phone call <laughs> and you know you don't have to be in this intimidating space, you can be in your own living room with your you know, cat on your lap, that's a, that's a wildly different experience for a young person. So, you know, there's, there's some catch 22s that are, uh, that are definitely inlaid in this kind of new criminal justice system, because, you know, lots of youth criminal justice appearances last less than a minute, <laughs> you know, and so you can imagine that a young person could be traveling an hour wait in the courtroom for an extended period of time and then have their lawyer get up for a minute, right? And so there's a real question of whether that's a valuable use of a young person's time. And so, you know, there's some new opportunities in kind of this system for there to be advancement, but it has to be advancement that doesn't leave behind the most vulnerable young people in the system. Samira, just to go along with that, do you think that this will create any changes long term? Like, do you think that any of these things will continue? Like the ability for young people to be able to call in to court, for example? It's a very interesting question, right? Um, and I don't think that the answer is clear at this time. Um, but, you know, the criminal justice system has always been slow to reform. So <laughs> we can kind of predict that this, uh, you know, might get undone pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess that's the thing about the pandemic, right? I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen in terms of sustainability and long term effects. But it's really interesting to think about maybe there are spaces for, for opportunity rather than always thinking about the negative aspects. So we've asked you quite a few questions and, and thanks so much for considering our questions. Um, we'd like to ask you, you know, if you have any questions that you'd actually like to pose to our students or to our audience in the context of, of rights and, and the criminal justice system, um, feel free to pose any types of questions that you might like our audience to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that the question that I would pose is, you know, what should the age of criminal responsibility be? We know and understand that brain development goes till 25. We know that crime is a young person's game. Um, so the question is, should, should, should it be 12 as it is under the youth criminal justice system? Or should it be, 18? Should it be 25? Um, and I think that's a really interesting question to devote some thought and attention to. Thanks, Amira. That's wonderful. Okay, so I think that's all of our questions. So thanks again, Samira, for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.